Algorithms and Programs Part 3. The objectives for video three start with validation and verification. And this is where we need to identify, explain, and apply, and apply the appropriate techniques of validation and verification in algorithms and programs. So what is this all about then? Well, you hopefully remember that validation and verification is essentially a way of checking that the data typed into a program is correct, or at least looks correct. Validation is making sure the data is valid, it looks sensible, and verification is making sure the data is actually correct. So data can be valid without being correct, without being verified properly. So let's have some examples of them. The validation are in blue and the verification are in red. Validation are things like presence check, where we check that there is actually data being typed in. A length check, how many characters are in there. A range check, if it's between two numbers or two values. A lookup check, if there's a list of options that it could be. A format check, does it look a certain way? A letters and numbers in the right places. Or a type check, is it an int? Is it a string? Is it a float? Or a real number, in other words. Now for verification, there are fewer options that can be automated. There's dual entry, where we ask for the same bit of data twice and we check they both match. This is used often in passwords to make sure you've spelt them correctly. And the only other real form of verification is proofreading, making the user read over it and check it's okay. But there's not a lot we can look at there in terms of programming. Now, I can't give you examples of all of these, but we'll see a few in the activities and the past papers. But let's just take one, a range check for instance, and look at some code for how you might build that. In this case, I'm looking to make sure that an age is between zero and 18. So we're taking in the index value and we're using a while loop to say, well, if the index value is less than zero or it's greater than 18, then they're incorrect values. So if that's the case, we'll print the error and input the index again, get the user to type in a number and we'll keep looping there until they finish that data, they get the correct age in there and we can exit it. You see that the power of a validation check because we don't let the user continue and put useless data in our system unless that first step is okay. The second objective here is logical operations in algorithms and programs. We need to identify, use and explain logical operators and algorithms and programs, including NAND and NOR. Now I've talked about NAND and NOR in the logical operations section. Go back and have a look at those if you want a bit more detail on them. But basically, the only way you use logical operators in code is to manipulate the conditions in, co in the appropriate construct. So for instance, in an if statement, the condition is the bit in the brackets and we'd use logical operations in there to combine questions, to combine conditions together or negate conditions. They're also really useful when working with Boolean values because they allow us to change a Boolean value very, very quickly. So let's have a look at the classic logical operations and see a sample bit of code. Our not operation, you remember this inverts the Boolean output, gives you the opposite. You might have that as if not valid data. And if valid data is a Boolean value, then we get if it's not turned on, if it's not a one or a true value. In other words, if it's false. And it's just a nice quick way of saying that. And then requires both values to be true and we just, we just join up the conditions with an and. So if the value is valid and it is text, then we can move on or requires either of them to be true, or both of them could be true. If is text or is number is true in this case, or both of them are true, it'll move into the if statement. XOR or exclusive or could be done this way, and this is where only one of the values must be true. So is text or is number must be true, not both. You could use XOR if your programming language supports it. If your language doesn't support XOR as a standard, it's a bit more complicated to do an exclusive or, and it's a combination of ors and ands. It's if is text is on and is number is not on, or is text not on and is number is on. A bit more complicated to build that with just ands and ors, but it is possible. NAND, one of our new logical operators, is not and, so it can be constructed with just a NAND container, or in this case, we put not and we put the and in brackets. So in this case, if not, is valid and is text at the same time. Our final new logical operator, nor, not, or, can be constructed in exactly the same way. We want to use nor if nor is available to us, but if it's not, it's not, then bracket for the or statement. Traversal of data structures then, well, this is reasonably a large section on its own. You need to be able to read and write algorithms that allow you to move through different data structures. Now, one of our units is all about data structures. And there are many of them to choose from. You've got one, two, and three D arrays, stacks, queues, linked lists, and binary trees. I'm gonna take 
all of those ones in gray and just say go and look at 3.1 data structures for more information on those they're covered in a lot more detail there than i'll be able to put into it in this section but the examples I want to give you are of 1, 2, and 3D arrays in this unit. Go and have a look at 3.1 data structures if you want a bit more on those others. So we start with, say, a one-dimensional array. To be able to iterate through it, I'm just using, in this case, a while loop, and I'm moving through one index location at a time because it's one-dimensional. When it's two-dimensional, we need a bit more, and I'm using for loops in this case. So we've got a for loop to work through the row, so it moves through a row at the time, and then within that, a for loop to go through the column. So the way it accesses the data is it goes through each row and each column in the row, then the next row and each column in the row, and then the next row and each column in the row. And the only thing you need to remember here really is that we always talk about the row before the column, because this isn't a grid in the normal sense of it, we're just using a grid to understand how it works. It is an array of arrays, really, behind the scenes. When you're going three-dimensional then, we're basically getting different versions of the same table. And in this example, I've got different days of our timetable. We'll need another loop for level, and that's before the row and column. And so this time we're gonna go through the first level first, and exactly the same way as a 2D array, we'll go through a row at a time and a column at a time. When we get to the final version of that, we'll increase the value for level, we'll go to the second level, and we'll work our way through this. Now, please don't forget that all of this stuff is zero indexed, so zero is the first item in all of them, but it's reasonably straightforward to build these algorithms. The compression data objective is about explaining data compression and how data compression algorithms are used. We'd also need to compare and explain the efficiency of them in terms of compression ratio, compression time, decompression time, and the saving percentage. Well, let's have a look at what we mean. First of all, data compression is the process of reducing the amount of memory that a file uses. And what we're usually doing is trading memory space for more processing when we need to load the file up. There are two main formats that we need to care about. Lossless is our first one. That reduces the file size without losing any of the original data so we can restore the original file. And a zip file is a good example of this. What happens is mathematically it looks for patterns and represents those patterns in a more efficient way. The only way to load the original file is to unzip or uncompress the file in this case to see it. Lossy files are a little bit different. We reduce the file size by removing some of the data, data that, the, that a human wouldn't be able to see normally. We can never get back to the original file, so lossy compression is a destructive way of compressing data. And a good example of this would be an MP3 file, because the way an MP3 file works is it throws away frequencies that, that a human can't hear. And it does this to make sure that we can reduce the file size and store only the things that we can actually hear. To a human, an MP3 file is imperceptibly different to the original uncompressed WAV file. To a dog, who'd be able to hear more frequencies, I imagine they sound very, very different. What factors do we use when comparing them then? Well, we start with the compression ratio, which is the size of the compressed file divided by the original size, and that tells us the ratio of compression. Compressed time then is how long it takes to process that file into its compressed state, and then equally, decompression time, how long it takes us to decompress the file each time you want to see it. Finally, our saving percentage, the percentage smaller that the compressed file is than the original. And of course, depending upon the scenario you're in, you might want to sacrifice compression or decompression time for the compression ratio and saving percentages. Now, often the longer it takes to process, the better it is in terms of savings for the compressed file. So it is very context dependent. And you need to think very carefully about how that question was worded before attempting to answer it. 